Lanny, I want to um, make a, a, a personal comment. Yeah, I've been a, a member of leadership for about 12 years now and was coming with my parents for five years before that. And um, there, there's a person here who I think we all see with her high energy level and the, the devotion she has to this organization. But now that I'm on the executive board, I've seen it in a whole new level. So from George Sandikos to Paulette Poulos, who is a, truly a gift to us, thank you for all that you do. Thank you, really, truly. It's remarkable. It's just remarkable. She works on three hours of sleep a night because she's working until <laughs> late and up early in the morning. So our, our, our speaker today. Uh, for over 80 years now, uh, the Manitos family has had a unique opportunity to work with hundreds of our country's most influential policymakers and thousands of our community's best and brightest across the country. Well, this morning, I have the pleasure of introducing someone who we believe rises at the top of both lists and she's nowhere near finished with her ascent. Many of you know Ambassador Lenny Tsokopoulos Kunalakis by the title of her new book, Madam Ambassador. Although in our house, she's known as Ambassador Nuna. <laughs> Lenny made Greek-American history when she became the first Greek-American woman ever appointed as an ambassador of the United States. She made U.S. history as well, because at age 43, she was one of the youngest women in U.S. history to rep represent our country abroad. And when she was sworn in as U.S. Ambassador to Hungary, where she served from 2010 to 2013, she was sworn in by then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, a longtime close friend of Eleni's and her family. It was an intimate private ceremony that included only three others with whom Eleni is also extremely close. Her dad, a U.S. Supreme Court justice, and the first female Speaker of the House in U.S. history. As the kids say nowadays, that's how she rolls. <laughs> During her service, Ambassador Kunalakis received two meritorious honor awards and was nominated by her staff for the Susan M. Cobb Award for Distinguished Diplomatic Service. She's continued her relationship with the State Department as a non-resident fellow and serves as a member of the Association of American Ambassadors. Regarding her book, which is titled Madam Ambassador, Three Years of Diplomacy, Dinner Parties, and Democracy in Budapest, I strongly encourage you to read it. She generously donated a copy to each of us in our registration bags. But don't take that somewhat biased word from her longtime friend, Kubato. Listen to what others had to say about it. The Washington Post said, quote, Kunalakis was a quick study, bringing a politically savvy businesswoman's instincts for negotiation and the reading of power dynamics. This is one political appointee who was in no way in over her head. Former Secretary of Homeland Security, Janet Napolitano, said, quote, it's an inspiring example of a businesswoman turned diplomat taking every opportunity to effectively advance the interest, values, and security of our country. House Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi said, Ambassador Kunalakis brings us inside the world of American diplomacy in a personal, accessible way, sharing her experiences as a diplomat during challenging times. Others of you know Eleni as Madam Philanthropist, committed to the advancement of Hellenic ideals, she and her husband, a veteran journalist and fellow Cretan, Marcos Kunalakis, who were married by his All Holiness Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew at the Ecumenical Patriarchate, endowed not one but two university chairs at Georgetown and Stanford dedicated to the study of Athenian democracy. She serves on the board of the Hellenic Initiative, is a founding member of faith, and as many of you know, a longtime member of Leadership 100. She received the highest lay honor one can receive from the Greek Orthodox Church, the Medal of St. Paul, and served for nearly 10 years as a trustee of the World Council of Religions for Peace. Others of you know her as Madam California. For 18 years of her career, Lenny was a very successful Northern California businesswoman, serving as president of AKT Development Corporation, one of California's largest land development firms. Recently, Governor Brown appointed Lenny as chair of the California Advisory Council for International Trade and Investment. She also serves as a member of the board on UC Berkeley Haas School of, School of Business, where she received her MBA in 92, and she earned her undergraduate degree from Dartmouth. Previously, she served as a member of the California State World Trade Commission, the California First Five Commission, and the San Francisco War Memorial. And on top of all that, she's a wonderful mother to her two teenage boys. And when Senator Boxer recently announced her retirement, our phone started ringing off the hook, asking, was Eleni going to run for the California Senate seat? Well, while that wasn't the right time, many believe that as nice as Ambassador Kunalakis is, 
Senator Kunalakis, Governor Kunalakis, or Secretary of State Kunalakis has a nice ring to it as well. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Madam Ambassador Eleni Tsikopoulos Kunalakis. So, uh, Eleni has graciously agreed to uh, have a, a different format here, where it's more of an open discussion, a, a, a give and take Q&A between the two of us, and then we'll open it to the audience for questions. So, uh, the first question I have, and let me get this passage ready. This really is a fantastic book. I really enjoyed it. Um, what role have orthodoxy and Hellenism played in your life? Now, before you answer, let me read uh, a passage from the book that uh, really touched me. And again, this is a book not about her Greek-American heritage, about her serving as ambassador in Hungary and dynamics there, but she really devoted a lot of attention to the subject matter that's all close to our hearts. As a young Greek-American, I grew up with stories my father told me about ancient Greece. Some of these stories he'd heard from his father, who'd heard them from his own. Others he'd learned as an adult, reading the works of Aristotle, Plato, the great philosophers, and historians of the golden age of Greece, the birthplace of democracy. After college, I lived in Greece, attending lectures by the great professor and rabbi Nikos Stavroulakis, while working as an editor at an English language daily paper, the Athens News. Before I returned to the United States in the summer of 1990, I worked at an archaeological site in Episcopi, carefully and slowly evacuating 2,400-year-old structures just a few miles from the village where my father was born. When I was a girl, the Greek Orthodox Church had been the center of our family life. As far back as I can remember, all of our friends were Greek. Some were fresh off the boat, or at least off a plane from Athens, while others were first and second generation Americans whose parents or grandparents had come from the old country. The members of this tightly knit community helped and supported one another, skinned and roasted lamb together, and spent long hours in the church hall socializing after services. Now here's a part that I think you all will particularly enjoy. By the time I returned from Greece as a young adult, my father and Sophia had become involved with an organization called Leadership 100. Leadership 100 was, and still is, the most prominent association of Greek-American leaders in the country. Though it had been established to support the Greek Orthodox Church, the group had brought together some of the United States' most influential and successful people. People engaged in polit U.S. politics, international affairs concerning Greece, and the dissemination of Greek history and culture. Leadership 100 was the epicenter of Greek-American influence, sophisticated in its outreach and organization even if its members still like to celebrate with whole roast lambs and vigorous ring dancing. <laughs> so Lenny, Orthodoxy and Hellenism, tell us about your, uh, your connection. Oh my goodness, I, I don't know where to begin, Mike. Thank you for the beautiful, gracious introduction. Thank you for choosing that passage to start things off. Um, but first, may I just recognize your eminence, your grace, Paulette. Thank you all so much for having me here today. Um, I think Mike just made it clear that Leadership 100, the Greek American community, our beautiful church, um, is all very central in my life. And uh, I first came to leadership, I think I was maybe 25, 26 years old. My father and my stepmother brought me. That's where we met. Uh, and I met so many friends and so many people in this community who I continue to be close with. So it's really a great honor to be back again and to be here with my husband, Marcos. Um, you know, I came back from Hungary about two and a half years ago, and it was such a profound experience for me where I felt that, you know, one day I'm a businesswoman in California, and the next day I'm top of the chain of command of a U.S. embassy in a former Soviet satellite state, and a lot happened, a lot of experiences, a lot of, you know, being, um, having a top secret SCI clearance and everything that goes along with that. And then three and a half years later, I was back home again uh, in our apartment in San Francisco and, um, you know, seeing old friends who were, would always invariably say to me, so what was it like? What was that experience like? And it took me about 300 pages to talk about it and to explain what it was like. And I'm so grateful that I took the time to write down my story because I think I might have forgotten parts of it. And it, it really was um, an experience that I wanted to be able to bring to my friends, to my family, um, and to have memorialized. And there's no question that what informed my journey every step of the way um, is being a Greek-American woman, an Orthodox Christian, 
uh, and um, and a, a member of of the the Greek diaspora uh, and and the culture and the um, morality that goes along with both being Greek Orthodox and being a Philhellene, a, a Hellene, really. Um, I think that for many of us who grew up in the church, uh, so much comes naturally. But you hit a point as a young adult where you really have to make a decision of how you're going to um, engage with, with your faith going forward. And for me, it really happened um, when I was about in my late 20s, and I was invited by a friend of my father's, Angelo Sokopoulos, I know a close friend of many of you here. Um, his name is Richard Blum, and he was putting together a group of his friends and business leaders from different religious backgrounds to become trustees of an organization called the World Council of Religions for Peace, which the Archbishop is also very involved in. And it's one of the largest, if not the largest, interfaith organization in the world. And what I found is that because I was there as a Greek Orthodox, um, a member of the Greek Orthodox Church, I suddenly became an informal um, spokesperson, really, a representative of the church. And suddenly, I needed to um, be able to talk about what it meant um, and understand what it meant to be Greek Orthodox in this interfaith context. And um, I had... A, I was sitting at a lunch with, um, uh, with uh, uh, Archbishop um, Demetrius, and I asked him um, what he thought about Buddhism, because I was reading quite a bit, and there were Buddhist members of this organization. And he, he answered some questions, and then he leans in and he says, just remember, Eleni, everything you're looking for, you will find in our church. And I started reading and understanding and talking and asking questions of the religious leaders in my life. And you know what emerged um, for me, um, most strongly above all else, is that our faith is, without question, it is based on love. And when you think about love as a guiding principle, as an organizing principle, as the principle with which you engage in not just your personal life, but in business and in politics and in foreign policy, in leadership, you start to understand that it's not, it's not always easy to approach the world and to engage in the world with that philosophy. And yet what it produces, what it produces when you approach any problem, any situation, any challenge, from a place of love, of compassion, of understanding, of forgiveness, it makes a very big difference in how you end up at the end of those challenging moments and difficult negotiations. And, um, you know, and so really, that's, that's what I embraced about our church. And, and so it has become very central uh, to me and my, my philosophy, not just my personal philosophy, as I said, but in my philosophy of leadership. That's beautiful. beautiful. Um, if we could uh, pivot to something that I know you're spending a lot of your time on these days, the Hillary Clinton presidential campaign. In 2008, you were uh, national co-chair of that Hillary for President campaign and were the head of Greek Americans for Hillary. This campaign, taking it to a whole new level, already hosted two extremely fundraisers, one in California, one in New York. And in fact, I guess just yesterday, we're in Nevada with uh, campaigning for Haley with your two young sons as well, which is great. So we'd love to hear more about your role in the campaign and why you think Hillary Clinton would be a good president. So um, look, one thing I know about leadership is that we all come to this with very, very different political uh, ideology and background and activism. Um, and so I guess I take a little bit, I, I, I always try to take the diplomat's view of things because when you work overseas, you realize that um, the outside world looks, us at, looks at us not as Democrats and Republicans or independents, they look at us as America. And so, um, yes, I have worked with Secretary Clinton. I've known her for so many years. I believe in her leadership. I have seen her problem solve. 
uh, and I know her as a policy wonk, as a person who gets into the thick of things, who actually, as divisive as his, her public profile can be, um, is very effective at knocking heads together and trying to find solutions across party lines and across, as I saw her in, as Secretary of State, um, bringing people together with old, divergent, entrenched points of view to try to find solutions and a way forward. So I am very, very committed to her campaign. But I'll also just point out that um, it's very important as Americans in this world that is becoming more and more complicated, more and more difficult, that um, you know, when you're faced with great challenges, bringing people together, finding ways to come together to meet those challenges is much better than fighting among ourselves. And, you know, the ancient Greeks certainly knew this. They, they um, could fight among themselves at the Peloponnesian, you know, in the, the um, city-states and the Peloponnesian Wars. But when there was a great outside threat, as there was uh, with the Persians, it brought them together. And so I really hold out great hope that um, as we face the challenges ahead of us, that we come together. Elections tend to be a time where we, you know, what they say, it's a contact sport, and we roll up our sleeves and, and we get into it. Um, but I think it's very important that, um, that we do recognize that the rest of the world is looking to American leadership, and finding ways to come together is very important. And I think the old guard definitely has had that. I was watching part of Antonin Scalia's funeral this morning on TV. Maybe some of you saw it. And um, someone commented that um, Justice um, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was very broken up about the, su the sudden loss of her colleague. And we know the two of them constantly at odds on the Supreme Court with their different opinions. Now, I'm a big fan of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We um, liberal Democrat women call her notorious RBJ for her, <laughs> for RBG, for her, uh, for her positions. And he, of course, on a very different part of the spectrum. Both of them probably more vocal about their, their personal views. Um, and she was so broken up by this, she said she felt she'd lost her brother. And so to me, that's a real example that we can have vigorous debates over the direction of our country, over political philosophy, over differences in opinions, over policy. But we have to remember that we all agree in the importance of our country, in the strength of our country, in the security of our country, uh, and that ultimately we, we never seek to undermine our leadership, whether we voted for them or not, in terms of their ability to move our country forward. Democratic primary, the Republican primary, and please include your thoughts about the Donald. <laughs> I think Look again, I, I always, I always hesitate because I right. know we have a broad spectrum of people here, and you know these are just my personal opinions. Um, but you know, one of my sons, so my sons are 13 and 14. They are um, volunteering in Nevada right now. They were, they were canvassing, and now they're at a caucus site getting ready for what will be in about 45 minutes, the beginning of the, of the uh, Nevada caucuses for the Democrats. So uh, again, I have very strong, passionate, engaged feelings um, about who I'm for. But one of my sons said to me, if Donald Trump is president, are we going to leave the country? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, if Donald Trump is president of the United States, we are going to respect our president. That is how it works. We have to come together. We will vigorously can't, you know, organize for and advocate for our um, issues. And among them, of course, the issues affecting relations between Greece and the United States, which is something else that I'm very passionate about. But if we let go of, in, of, of respect for our institutions, for the institution of the presidency, for the institution of the Supreme Court, of the institution of Congress, of the institutions of um, not just government, but of universities, and, and all of these things that we've developed in our very advanced civil society, we will live to regret it. And so that, that is truly, Mike, that is truly how, how I feel. Now, of course, partisans over a couple of glasses of wine, I may give a little bit more um, 
uh, partisan opinions on it, but, but I do really think it's very important, especially because we come together here as Americans, we come together here as members of the Orthodox Church, we come together here as fellow Greek Americans, and what connects us, that is why we all come together, and I think it's very important that, that we focus on that while we're here together. Also. If anyone is more interested, interested in getting more involved with Hillary's campaign, of course, you can come to me on the side, and I'd be happy to talk to you. Back to your book. Um, curious if you could share some of your most memorable moments from your ambassadorship, although I should start by reading the first two sentences of your book, which is one of my favorite parts. So the book starts, I lifted my rifle and peered through the military scope at a snow-roughened landscape scanning the dead corn stalks and winter stripped trees for wild boar. Crouched in the chill of a Spartan wooden hunting blind, listening to helicopters patrol the nearby border of Hungary and Ukraine, I wondered if any other United States ambassador had ever been in my situation. <laughs> so tell us about some of the most memorable situations you were in. Um. So yes, chapter one of my book is called Boar Hunt. And uh, a friend of mine who's a writer told me, you know, you have to start your book with this story because of all the stories you've told, it's the one that's most revealing of you. And, uh, and so I thought about why she would think that that was true because she's a good, a good friend of mine. And, um, you know, I grew up in the Sacramento Valley, again, with this very vibrant Greek-American community, everyone helping each other. Um, and, and working together and celebrating together and worshiping together uh, and hunting together. And my father has five daughters and one son, and he was pretty clear that he wanted his girls to, he wanted to share uh, his passions with his girls as much as with his son. And so we grew up target practicing and, and you know, shooting guns and going out on these um, mostly bird hunts, so pheasant and a dove. And, uh, and even if we were there sort of as support staff that, you know, we didn't have trained dogs, so somebody had to go run out and pick up the birds uh, and bring them back and put them in the bag. And then when we got back to the house, you know, we, he, my father lined all the kids up. We would sit, you know, in chairs on a bench with a big basket of birds and pluck all the birds. And then the dads would clean them and the moms would cook them. So, um, so this was just part of my life. And when I got to um, Hungary, what, what one of the biggest challenges for me was that I was thrown into this position as the highest ranking American officer in the country. Um, we, had a, we had a very significant military presence there. And even though the chain of command is different, they threw the Department of Defense and I threw the Department of State, I was the highest ranking American. And so all of their activities were also under the umbrella of the embassy of which I was the top of the chain of command. So very early on, my military attache, Colonel Duggleby, who's a character in this book, who appears and reappears, um, Colonel Duggleby was programming me to do things with um, U.S. officers and also with Hungarian officers who were training together. And I found that this was as much out of my comfort zone as anything. And so I was trying to figure out how do I, I don't know how to talk to colonels and generals. I, I, I've never had this experience before, but I wanted to as quickly as possible get good at it. So I was looking for ways to bond and I thought, well, you know, they go out for target practicing. I've had a lifetime of target practicing. And so I went out and I was doing target practice. And I thought, this is a way, you know, I can talk about hunting. This is maybe a way that I can bond um, and as starting point to be able to understand what their challenges are and what their culture is within the military. And so Colonel Duggleby was so impressed with this idea that I was a hunter. Um, even though it had been many years, really, since, you know, my kids, Marcos, you know, and I keep busy with all kinds of other things. But, you know, once you know how, it doesn't really leave you. So they invited me on this trip, and I, I jumped at the opportunity to do something. Again, I was, I was the only woman. There were about 30 of us. Everyone was military except for me. Um, even my political advisor from the State Department was a former Marine. He's about six and a half feet tall, Paulo Friel, who's an incredible person, is also 
in the book quite a bit. Um, there was a young woman who was there as a translator. Someone told her she was translating for the U.S. ambassador, so she was dressed kind of like I am, right? And sitting in a boar blind um, with the kind of dainty shoes and it's frozen snow, you know, so we bundled her up with, uh, with blankets, you know, but there were a couple of takeaways of this for me, and one is, and I, and I, uh, I think the young, your kids who are here are off hiking and doing other things, um, but what I always uh, emphasize with young people is that take every opportunity to do things, um, even if they're challenging, even if they're outside of your comfort zone, because you grow through these opportunities. And so, so, um, so here I was, and I was absolutely determined that, um, you know, because I could hear from the other blinds, there was a lot of gunshot going off. And I thought, I'm going to get back, and they're all going to, you know, feel bad if I don't get anything. And I shot a lot of birds. You shoot those with a shotgun. Shooting an animal, a large 250-pound animal with a rifle is a very different experience. And I was really determined that I wanted to um, succeed in this and not go back empty-handed. So um, we were out there. We were the last, the three of us, my interpreter, my hunt guide, and myself were the last group to come back. And um, we come back, and the military guys, they all come out, and they're like, Madam Ambassador, we're so sorry. We brought you out here on the, a terrible day for hunting. No one got anything except for a General Tumble got a small piglet. And I said, oh, but I got one. I got a boar. <laughs> and I had a 250-pound boar in the back of the, the Jeep. <laughs> Bravo. So, uh, <laughs> so um, but I really do, I mean, the main reason that I wrote about this wasn't just because it was exciting and it was challenging and it was different and it was ultimately successful. And when we got back to Budapest, word sped like wildfire that this, you know, <laughs> I look, you know, like a... I, especially at 43, I looked like, you know, a, a girl. And, uh, and it really helped set the stage um, not to be underestimated. Don't mess with the ambassador. But, <laughs> but truly that experience for me was about engaging with the military because soon after I came back, um, it, I was um, seeing a group of about 15 Ohio National Guardsmen um, with their Hungarian counterparts um, off at the airport as they were rotating into Afghanistan. And it was really very important to me to do everything that I could to understand the U.S. military, to be worthy of that role. And I took uh, two trips into Afghanistan during the time that I was, I was there. I went with the Hungarian military also down to Sarajevo and to Kosovo because they had a major operation there, which the United States was very involved in. Uh, and I took these opportunities, and I will tell you that the takeaway for me um, is great respect, uh, admiration, and appreciation for our military and for the role that it plays in keeping us safe. What impact do you think you had as ambassador? It was a very turbulent time. It was, it was. So I hope you read at least parts of the book, and I wrote it in such a way that if you want to kind of skip the Hungarian experience, you can. Um, but it when I first got there, the relationship between the United States and Hungary was so well established. Hungary is a member of the, the European Union. Hungary uh, was a member of NATO, um, a member of the Visa Waiver Program. It seemed to me that there really wouldn't be very much um, that I would be asked to advance from a bilateral, from the point of view of the bilateral relationship. Um, and things changed very dramatically when I was there. Uh, a government was elected in 2010 with a two-thirds supermajority and with a very clear political philosophy. So the two-thirds supermajority allowed them to make changes to the Constitution, and there was even talk that they would adopt a new Constitution. And at the beginning, you know, members of the opposition, members of civil society, they were saying, well, maybe there will be a referendum, you know, a new constitutional process can be a great opportunity. And we were um, asked, you know, people would, reporters and people would ask me publicly, what do you think about that? And the U.S. line was like, well, you know, we have been around the block when it comes to democracy and we encourage an inclusive process. Uh, Justice Kennedy, who's a good friend, came early on in this process, met with 
um, those who were working on the document. And it was always about you know, inclusiveness. Well, um, the government wrote the, this new constitution, passed it very quickly, along with about 700 new laws um, with very, very little public participation, almost no participation from opposition parties. They wrote it, they passed it, and it became law, um, sometimes without even legal review because of one of the processes to get um, new bills done that didn't necessarily have to go through their equivalent of the Justice Department. And, uh, and it was very rapid and completely transformed the legal infrastructure and all of the, um, all of the institutions of democracy that guide a, a country, whether it's the legal system and the judiciary system, whether it's the um, media or the central bank, everything was transformed. And as part of this transformation, um, it brought in new people into positions of authority, most of whom were very close to the government, uh, that would regulate these new institutions or newly um, uh, uh, reformed institutions. And the United States became increasingly concerned as this process went forward. Uh, and at one point, Secretary Clinton um, categorized what was happening in Hungary as democratic backsliding. So, um, so this is part of the story. And the way that I've tried to present it in my book is really as a case study for what happens in um, US diplomacy when you, the United States and one of our allies who were so, seeing eye to eye and so cooperative for so many years, certainly since the, uh, the wall fell uh, and the Iron Curtain fell, uh, that suddenly now we have these fairly significant differences. And when is it appropriate for the United States to speak out and in what way? And how do you do it in a way that can be effective and not alienate a country that is a friend and an ally. So we walked a very, very fine line along the way um, through this process of great transformation in this country. Now what's happened since then is um, about a year after I left, Viktor Orban, this very powerful prime minister, gave a speech where he talked about the end of illiberal democracy in Europe and the, I'm sorry, the end of liberal democracy in Europe and the rise of illiberal democracy and his view that illiberal democracy is better. And the word liberal and illiberal don't mean the same things in that context as we think of, you know, here in the United States. The United States is a liberal democracy whether you are a liberal or a conservative. It's our system of government that allows for a great deal of public participation in our process and the spreading of power, not just through the three branches of government, but through all of our institutions. So um, illiberal democracy might be something like Singapore, where you have free elections, um, but there are elements of their democracy that constrict individual freedom and constrict, frankly, the ability of opposition parties to rise in any significant way. And what he was doing is saying, look, we're looking for new models. He said this very clearly. We're looking for new models for our democracy, where models like Russia, like Turkey, like um, China, which isn't even a democracy at all, in his words. So um, now, you know, at the time, he was this sort of isolated voice. But now we've seen, most recently in the elections in Poland, and also, you know, back and forth in Slovakia, I don't know how familiar you all are with the politics of Slovakia, but what you're seeing, particularly in Central Europe, is this move away from um, the diffusing of power through the system, through the um, institutions of democracy, and the consolidation of power in the hands of strong government. And uh, this is creating what I consider to be um, a significant crisis in Europe except for all of the other crises that are happening in Europe right now. But it's one that is playing into the way that Europe is going to be dealing with the ongoing economic crisis there and now, of course, the refugee crisis.
as well. So we played our role during the time that we're there. Um, you know, Secretary Clinton talks about passing the baton, that she walked into the State Department, she ran down the field as far as she could, and then she handed the baton off. That is what it feels like in a government job like this. Um, so I think that our team at the embassy did a very good job, um, but history doesn't stop. Things keep going, and the challenges persist. If we could pivot to Greece. Um, I know in the, in the economic crisis, they struggled with their Great Depression. You've been very proactive. You had many meetings with high-level officials in, in Greece and the United States. Um, and also, if you, I'd love to hear your thoughts about uh, what needs to be done in Greece, maybe share some of the things you've been doing. And maybe if you tuck in there also the refugee crisis, mm -hmm. and not only Greece trying to, to handle that, the heroic way in which they're doing so, but also maybe the role, the controversial role that Hungary's playing in that. I know the, um, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees had asked you to go um, do some business over there right before you injured your leg. So I know you're very active on that issue as well. Well, it's ironic because Mike Manitos could answer this question at least as well as I could, probably better because the Manitos family is very much on the ground in the vortex of Greek-American relations in Washington, D.C., and I'm very proud to work with you and your father uh, on these issues, Mike, and, um, uh, and I'm so proud because no one in the Greek-American community, no family has been able to track and advance these issues three generations without, um, you know, without controversy, <laughs> right? Within the community, you all have managed to really do such an effective job in bringing Greek Americans around these issues to advance them from the Greek American, from the U.S. perspective, frankly. And uh, I'm very proud to be part of that effort. Uh, I'm also a fellow. I continue to work with the State Department as a non-resident fellow. Uh, and these issues are very important to me. We have always, and what my father, Angelo Sokopoulos, raised me with is this notion that we always approach engagement with Greece as Americans. That what our interest is primarily um, is, not, is not, our interest is not, number one, the security of Greece. Our issue, number one, is the security of the United States. And the security of Greece and stability in that region is essential to our security. So it's always from this approach, with this approach, that, that I look at these issues, examine these issues, and attempt, along with my husband, to help advance um, the interests of the United States. Uh, which, again, very, very often are... Um, aligned with the interests of, of Greece and the stability and the, and the security of Greece. So um, having said that, I will tell you I'm still very concerned um, about the financial crisis and its effects. Um, it's out of the headlines, it, it, ensuring that um, Greece would stay in the European Union. Um, Germany had had enough. France um, was losing the argument, and Tsipras um, had painted himself into a corner, and right about the beginning, middle of July, Greece was 48 hours away from a Grexit. And the White House engaged very vigorously to convince the Germans to give this one more shot and to convince the Greek government to back away from their very clear um, positions in order to be able to give it one more chance for Greece to stay in the Eurozone. And um, that to me was a very critical point, but the work is certainly not over. And I know um, there are people here, and I'm going to point out my other Kubata Costanza's book, Constantinopoulos, who's here as well from Greece. She's the developer of Costa Navarino. If you've been, or if you're thinking about going, uh, extraordinary, extraordinary place, and she is doing so many things in helping to, in helping people who are most affected in Greece by the crisis, uh, in, including working with the church and their efforts. And I think you may also have seen the Yerolanu family is also here. These are the great-great-grandchildren of Andonis Benaiki, 
who founded the Benaiki Museum. Mike and I are very involved in trying to help the Benaiki find support here in the United States. And I could talk very passionately about the Benaiki for a long time, but it is a rock solid, extraordinary organization. Um, and if you have a chance, go and see the exhibit uh, and give them whatever support you can uh, during this crisis. But, um, but the economic crisis is going to continue to be um, a challenge for Greece and for Europe and for the US, I think it's safe to say, for some time um, going forward. And it's largely because uh, there are still intractable problems in how to dig Greece out of the hole. Um, but I'm very hopeful that, um, that the worst is behind us and that the commitment that was expressed last summer to keep Greece in the Eurozone is, uh, and part of Europe in, in the economic union is, is going to stick. The refugee crisis is um, very, very troubling, of course, um, because uh, whereas I think that the million to million and a half refugees that have already made their way into Europe can probably be uh, processed, these people can be, their, their applications for asylum can be processed, places can be found for them. Um, there is no end in sight to the refugees that are leaving Syria in particular, but other countries in, in Africa and, and in the Middle East because of the um, uh, because of the violence in, in, uh, in the Middle East and in Africa. So um, I'm heartened by the fact that NATO has taken its first step in to help be supportive of, um, the, uh, uh, of um, engaging in a productive way. It's still unclear exactly how NATO will engage. Right now, at a minimum, it looks like they'll have patrols um, in between the coast of Turkey and the Greek islands. So at a minimum, these thousands of lives that are being lost really unnecessarily, that, that can be stemmed. But um, the Europeans have been vigorously engaging with Turkey on the, um, on, on the numbers of people who are leaving camps in Turkey to go into Europe. You know, again, about a million and a half people have, got, have entered into Europe in the last year, year and a half. The um, number of refugees that are still in Turkey is vast. There are somewhere around two to three million more refugees in camps um, in Turkey. There are several million who are in refugee camps uh, uh, in Jordan and in um, Lebanon. Thank you, Marco. And, uh, and no one has figured out exactly how to deal with this. But I think that there are some principles that are being recognized. One is to treat these people in a humanitarian way, to advocate against um, divisiveness and against xenophobia, to recognize that the vast majority of these people are leaving not as their choice, but because their, their cities are being bombed into dust, and, uh, and that these are peace-loving people who are um, looking after the security of their children. And uh, that also the idea that they should continue to flow into Europe rather than staying in these countries that are adjacent to their countries of origin, you know, it makes sense for them to stay where they are, but there are some problems, you know. Whereas refugees, if they get to Germany and they get refugee status, they actually have a path to being able to be resettled, put their kids in school and go to work those in these three countries I mentioned are really stuck in these refugee camps. They're not able to work. The kids are not going to school. And so trying to help support you know, international efforts, the United Nations efforts to make conditions better in those places is very important. And that ultimately what has to happen is there has to be a restabilization of the countries of origin, of Syria, so people can go home, they can rebuild their lives there, or they can stay there if they haven't already fled. This last part, you know, I think it's safe to say that we're not there yet. We are definitely not there yet. And with the complicating factors of Russia's involvement in Syria, we're even further away. So this is, this is where we are. And um, I think that 
in solving any problem, you have to start with recognition of the parameters of the problem, and I think that the Europeans, the Americans, the international community has gotten to that point, but now um, it, it can't languish because every day more and more people are, are getting killed. Children are now starving in parts of, of Syria, and, uh, and it's a, the humanitarian crisis continues to expand in just the most heartbreaking way. So here's the, the, one, another quote that really struck me about that combines orthodoxy and, and, um, and the, the role of the United States in the world. As I held the wet, slippery, slightly whimpering infant in my arms, the Archbishop gave what to me has long been the most meaningful blessing of what is certainly the most important rite of passage in Christianity. Quote, Lord, make Lucas a valiant warrior in the battle between good and evil that rages on this earth. End quote. I knew this blessing well, but for the first time, I didn't hear it just as a member of the Greek Orthodox faith. I heard the blessing as an American. When you're into my ambassadorship, I was more convinced than ever that there was indeed a battle between good and evil that raged in the world. I didn't think of this blessing strictly in religious terms. My years of work promoting interfaith understanding had made me respectful and embracing of all the world's religions. To me, it was about the rule of law, democracy, and freedom. Bringing democracy to the world is a slow, painstaking process, and not one that can be forced upon nations. But America, despite all of her faults and folly, all of her tragic mistakes, is still the largest force for the advancement of freedom and democracy the most powerful force for good that exists in the world. Thank you very well said. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Abraham Lincoln said the United States is the last best hope. And I believe it. I believe it, you know. But democracy is a very difficult type of government to achieve and then to maintain. It is a constant, constant uh, renewal, process of renewal to strengthen a democracy. And advancing democracy in the world is even harder. And it's not just um, when you go into a country and you try to educate people and help them organize and stave off corruption, which is truly the greatest threat to the ability to create and, and, and maintain a democracy. Uh, but then there are also cultural issues that can push back against it, whether it's um, uh, ethnic divides, uh, whether it's religious divides. Um, so, so I'm not, um, and I don't think the United States is naive in any way about how hard it is to, uh, to advance our principles and, and our um, values in the world. But at the same time, you know, I take the view that People don't need to be taught what freedom is. People know. People know what it means to be free. People know what it means to be able to build a life that is in accordance to what, what they want versus what a government or um, political leaders or religious leaders are telling them they have to do. And so that gives us a great advantage because if you believe that the human spirit is seeking freedom on some level and fairness on some level, and they don't need to be taught, they just know that we can leverage that. And you know, one example is you know, with the, uh, we call the, um, not the Arab Spring anymore, the Arab Awakening, the um, Tunisian uh, fruit seller who um, lit himself on fire in protest of the corrupt government that would not, and system, that to him seemed to only advance certain people, and that for the average person like him who wanted to open a store, and every effort he made to try to turn his cart into a store was squashed. Right? He didn't want to set the rules for the country. He wanted to open a store. And all of these, all these, these attempts that he made were thwarted. And he, self, he lit himself on fire as a demonstration of his frustration and anger of a system that constantly put roadblocks in his way. 
And, you know, to me, when we talk about, about this issue, it isn't about trying to make every country around the world in our image, but it is about the fundamental principle of rule of law. And that, in fact, rule of law, in some ways, is the first building block of a democracy. And, you know, Athenian democracy was this special moment in world history where citizens participated in their governance. But if you look at the Roman peace, the Pax Romana, it really was generated from the institution of rule of law and that there is a great deal of freedom that gets created when you have a system of laws that everyone lives under. And I think it's a very important thing to kind of break that down. And I think that as we look around the world today where there are, uh, according to Freedom House, there are fewer countries in the world that they classify as democracies than there were 20 years ago. Not more, fewer. That it's important to be looking at America's um, approach in advancing freedom and democracy with starting with the funda fundamental building blocks of rule of law. And I think that it will be less frustrating for us and we will be less likely to be criticized for our efforts if we not necessarily pull back to that, but focus, focus on that, on that approach. But do I think that it's worthy of our efforts? Absolutely. And is it simply because um, these are our values and it's the right thing to do? No. It's because we can't, I don't think that the United States will be able to continue to um, have our own system uh, over the long, long horizon if we don't advocate for our system. Because it is a constant battle and, and an ancient battle, really, that, uh, that, that we're engaged in. And it's worthy of the fight. And it's, you know, we are on the side of right when we think about it, uh, advancing a system of justice and rule of law. We are so proud of you. You are a role model for Greek American women and for all women in America. And we are very proud of your accomplishments. Um, I want to ask though, there are many young women here today, many of them who are just beginning th to pursue their careers. What advice would you give to these young women who may be interested in following in your path? Thank you very much, Paulette. And again, I, you are a role model. You are a role model for me, and I know you are still a role model for so many of the young women here with your hard work and incredible ability to get things done and do it well. So, <laughs> so I kind of pepper my book with kind of pieces of advice, things that have helped me as mundane as the fact that if you look in my closet, I have about 30 suits that look exactly like this. And as I was walking down, I realized that my picture on the back of the book, it is not the same suit, but it could be. Um, you know, things as mundane as basically finding efficiencies um, to really just, um, you know, when you start out, there are more young women in universities in the United States than there are young men. And yet something happens as you rise up in your career. And it's that path that you've got to get prepared for. Um, my children, having children to me was without question the most marvelous, wonderful, incredible experience of my life that I wouldn't trade for anything. I didn't know that before I had them. But, uh, but there's no question that they were, I, would, I would have given up my career without a doubt if, there, if I had to make a choice. You don't have to make a choice, but you do have to figure out how you're going to balance it all. And there's no formula for it. Um, if you, things like having um, your parents able to take care of your kids for a few days so that you and, you know, Laura, you will have a full-time job, that can make the difference between being able to work and not being able to work. 
So um, you have to kind of cobble it together. But one thing I think is very important is that for young women is that there's, there is this sort of moment where you have to decide how, you have to figure out if you have kids how you're going to cobble it together and keep it all together. And um, I think it helps to know that you can back away from a 24-7 job but not lose the thread of continuing to stay active and involved. Um, Nancy Pelosi has been, without question, my most important mentor. She had four children in five years. And she told me, when my boys were babies, she told me, look, there were days when I, I didn't even have time to wash my face, right? And I read the newspaper every day. I, nev I read the New York Times every single day when, I, my, when my kids were small. And when they got to be a little bit bigger, I, got, I went on the board of the Park Commission in San Francisco. And then when they were grown up, and the last one was in high school, that's when the opportunity came. She also was chair of the California Democratic Party. So it was this kind of incremental thing. Now, I can tell you that um, Anne Marie Slaughter, who wrote this very, um, uh, this, this article um, that went viral, um, she was the director of policy planning for the State Department, and she wrote an article saying why women can't have it all. And that she went into the State Department, her husband and their middle school age kids were in um, Princeton, and she was commuting back and forth, and it was a 24-7 job, and her life was falling apart, right? Now, my kids at an embassy, even though Anne Marie Slaughter's job and my job, well, you know, we're certainly on par in terms of the seniority at the State Department. There was a difference. She was in a 20, what I call a 24-7 job. And I wasn't. I had the ability to control my calendar. So if one of my kids got sick, I could stay home and I could move things around. And the people who I would have been meeting with that day wouldn't, wouldn't be offended by it if I met with them the next day. You know, Secretary Clinton was interviewed about Anne Marie Slaughter's piece, and she said, well, when my daughter was in middle school, Hillary said, I was first lady. Being first lady is a very different job than being secretary of state. Because again, it goes to uh, balance education um, and their early business experiences is to, you know, you're, you're looking at your biggest challenge, I think, is when you have to figure out how you're going to balance it all and not give up having kids if that's something you want to do. And that to not give up hope and you basically, there's no single role model, there's no single formula. You have to create your own formula. But even if you have to back away from more work intensive type of jobs, there are other jobs you can do that are less work intensive in terms of the hours and the control of your schedule. But no matter how far you have to back down, you can hold on to the thread of your career because one day, your kids are campaigning in Nevada without you, and uh, a few years after that, they're off in college. You know, another role model for me, you know, Nancy had Pelosi, four kids, Madeleine Albright, three kids. You know, it's a doable thing, and there are moments where you think it's really not doable, but it is. So long as you don't give up faith in your own ability to contribute, when you're sitting at home, heating up bottles, you know, and, and your clo all of your clothes are covered in, um, you know, in uh, formula and baby food, you know, that you hold on to that idea that, you, and not you just hold on to it, but that you allow yourself to embrace that wonderful time of when your kids are small, because it really, as we all know, goes very, very quickly. Other questions? Nick, I've got a couple. said that the Hungarian government had some subtle changes in their democracy. Do you think if Clinton is elected president, she will follow their course? <laughs> Certainly not the way the Hungarians have. Um, look, uh, I'm not sure how to answer this question, to talk about Hungary or talk about Secretary Clinton. Um, 
what, the, what Viktor Orban did was something that couldn't happen in the United States. Um, he, it, Hungary is a country of 10 million people. Their democratic institutions were 25 years old. Um, there were, they were the, probably the biggest difference. So, so the institutions were just not as, as established as ours are here in the United States. Um, one of the things that um, Justice Kennedy advocated for when he met with Prime Minister Orban and members of the Supreme Court and others as they were going through this constitutional reform process is he said um, there's a certain patina to things that only time can create. And so for them, his advice to them was to create a document that had the elements that would be able to withstand the test of time. And frankly, we are the world's oldest democracy now. And there is a patina to our institutions. There is a groundedness of our, to our institutions that makes them strong and will keep our democracy strong. But there's something else, and it's called civil society. So what she did when she went around the world is she would meet with leaders of civil society. So you can imagine Hillary Clinton, so famous, you know, I think how many years she's been on, you know, number one on the list of the world's most admired women. You know, Angela Merkel, Hillary Clinton, Diane, Princess Diana, Lady Diana, you know, uh, but she's been there since the time she was first lady, always at the very, very top of these lists of most admired women or most influential women of the world. And she would go into these countries and, you know, the, the, Government leaders were lined up to meet her. The business leaders, the power structure, the leaders of the power structure, predominantly men, would line up to meet her. And she would do those meetings and do them very well and with respect and, and in a way that would advance our interests and get things done. But she would always ask every embassy, set up a meeting for me with leaders of civil society. Now these are people who head up, head up organizations um, gay rights organizations, women's organizations, uh, organizations advocating for um, all, all, all manners of things. Uh, in our case, the Hungarian Civil, Li Civil Liberties Union, Freedom House. The people who were sort of the, the ones who were out there petitioning for better conditions, whatever they are. The gadflies, the people who are very often dismissed, discredited, yelled at, and ignored, but who keep out there demonstrating for whatever it is that they believe in, because it's their right to do that, just like it's their right to do that here in the United States. And she would meet with these, and, and these people are, they can't believe it. They can't get meetings with their own government officials. And Hillary Clinton is going to meet with them? And it really shook things up because what she did is just by bringing those people into a room and meeting with them, she elevated their voices. She empowered them. Now, you know, it was certainly her right to do it. She wasn't organizing against governments. She was just simply had a policy of meeting with civil society wherever she went. And in the United States, we have this incredibly established system. Leadership 100 is an organization of American civil society. Lawyers associations, doctors associations, school parent associations. This is all in the realm of civil society. And what Hillary Clinton um, argues is every healthy democracy has three legs of the stool. A, you have government, you have business, and you have civil society, which is basically everything else that happens in a democracy that isn't government and isn't business interests. Right? So for us, we don't even use the word civil society because it is so much a part of our society, of our country, of our communities. But in many countries in the world, the power is really in the hands of the political leaders and the business leaders. And that's it. And so in order for countries to get closer to having a, you know, a system of rule of law that protects the people, you really have to have civic engagement by individuals who know that they're not going to get thrown in jail or prosecuted for their activity. So I know that if she becomes president of the United States, a big part of her 
foreign policy will continue to be this advocacy that people engage as members of civil society in their country. Why? Because the United States cannot stand in for the role of civil society in countries around the world. People have to do it for themselves. We can help, we can meet with them, we can support them, we can encourage them, but we can't do it for them. So it was very much part of her um, organizing principle, as she would call it, of smart power, that, that encouraging people around the world to model civil society organizations and activism in their countries the way that we do it here in the United States is the most important thing that they can do to help advance their own interests and the strength and stability of their countries. We're getting close to our end time here, so okay. let's just take a couple more questions and let everybody get to this Next. beautiful Hi, day. Lenny. I enjoy very much your book. It was a tremendous read Thank and I really enjoyed it. I congratulate you and your family for all the great work that you do for our country and for U.S., Greece, and Cyprus relations. I guess the question I have is, um, when you're being briefed, when you take on a job of ambassador of the United States abroad, you serve at the pleasure of the president, his agenda, and the foreign policy of the United States. Did it ever concern you, or did you get briefed on, hey, you can't exercise your own opinions here. You really have to go out there and promote this agenda. And did you ever have any problem with that in terms of going into this? And how did they relay this to you? And then also coming from the private sector that you did and not from the career uh, diplomatic service, do you think it served you uh, in, in some ways better? I know it did in the real estate project with the building that you were involved in, mm -hmm. but was there any other ways that it, uh, it served you uh, in, in a positive way? Um, sure. Okay. So first of all, yeah, you are the president's appointee. You are there to, uh, to be a spokesperson and to deliver and advance the president's foreign policy. If you disagree, you either keep it to yourself or you quit. That's the rule. That's how it goes. I never had any fundamental difference of opinion in terms of fulfilling my duties. Um, I didn't have any problem advancing the foreign policy of the of, of President Obama. Um, that doesn't mean that I think that the President hasn't had enormous challenges um, which are going to frankly continue to persist and that we have to come together as a country to advance. But, um, but no, I, I didn't have any issue with that and I understood it very clearly. Um, as a businesswoman, sure. So we had this terrible hole that we had dug ourselves into with the Hungarian government over a, what was called a, a property swap. We had this um, historic piece of property where our marine detachment, marine security detachment lived, and the Hungarians desperately wanted, back, wanted it back. Beautiful piece of property. Um, and then they had a building next to our embassy, and the idea was that we would swap them. But it had been mired in problems, a lot of money had been spent, they'd gotten nowhere. And yeah, it was very fortuitous that I came into an embassy with a very difficult real estate portfolio. And if you go back, actually before I left, uh, we had topped out the reconstruction of the building next to us. And there is no question <laughs> that it was my real estate background that helped us get there. And I'm very proud of it because uh, it certainly made the footprint of our embassy in Budapest much better, and uh, it reduced our cost dramatically. So I'm very, very proud of that. But I, but I also think that, you know, we have this funny system, right, where most ambassadors from other countries around the world are career diplomats. They come in as young diplomats, they train, they rise through the chain of command, and then they go out as ambassadors. Three out of four, roughly, of our ambassadors come into the State Department and rise through the chain of command. One out of four of U.S. ambassadors are political appointees. Not all of them are real estate developers from California, let me tell you. A large chunk of them are former Congress members, former uh, senators, former um, state government officials, uh, people who come out of think tanks, who have expertise in an area, our very, very close friend, Mike McFall, a professor at Stanford who ended up in the White House, um, was the architect of the Russian reset and became 
a political appointee is the U.S. ambassador to Russia. So that one out of four political appointees, most of them are people with tremendous expertise. Then there's this slice in, in, in policy work for those countries. A slice of them, a slice of our ambassadors are people like me. And when I first got to the State Department, I'm going to be honest, I really questioned whether or not it was such a good idea <laughs> to send someone like me to run a several hundred person embassy when you had all these unbelievably talented State Department officers who trained their whole life in this work. And what I found was that, and I truly believe this, that's why I can be you know, very frank and open about it, is that there is something that business people bring to the institution of the State Department to our foreign service that is very helpful. Now what they say about us, the word in the hallways at the State Department, is that we're among the best and among the worst, <laughs> right? So it's really important that when the White House picks po political appointees from the business world, they really scrub them to know whether or not they're going to be able to do the job. Now for me, the most important quality was to be a good manager because you've got incredible talent and incredible expertise, but at the same time, these career officers, they, they, respect the chain of command so much so that they may not challenge you. And so if I say, well, you know, maybe we should do this, I think we should do this, they'll say, okay, that's what we're going to do, even if they think that it's folly. And so what's very important is that you create an atmosphere where your experts, because they truly are experts, feel very, very comfortable telling you when they think you're wrong and telling you when they think that uh, uh, there's a better way to get something done. And I developed, I worked very, very hard to create that, um, that element of trust within our embassy that the officers, you know, I was their superior officer. And I was encouraging them to, to work with me, to brainstorm with me, to talk with me, and to challenge me. And, uh, and it was, a, it was really a two-way street, but it was the most, it was more important than, um, it, it was very, very important. And because I had a business background, you know, my father raised me as a closer, right? Very often in policy, you can start, you look about moving the ball down the field, but there are moments where you have to close, right? And I think that that was a very important thing that I brought to the table and that I also was able to teach to these officers, right? Not to be afraid to close the deal and to stand by your, uh, you, you know, tough decisions that, that you make. Well, first of all, um, I encourage you to talk to Costanza Zbroku. She's been through this. Um, her father-in-law, Captain Vasily Konstantinopoulos, assembled several thousand individual parcels in order to be able to have the land to be able to develop Costa Navarino and the golf courses. And the stories are extraordinary. Um, Pablo Sierralanos, who, it, he's here, hello Pablo, uh, and his wife Lara. Lara has fisheries in Greece. And um, in fact, I, when I was meeting with uh, the foreign minister, right after he came into power back in Washington a few months ago, I said, what are you going to do about this? I have a friend who has a fishery. And uh, they say that there's not a single fishery in Greece that is operating legally because the legal infrastructure is so convoluted that they couldn't comply even if, you know, if they wanted to, which they want to. And he looks at me and he said, are you talking about Pavlos Yaralanos? <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is a persistent problem, and it is unacceptable, and it is without question the biggest roadblock to Greece's recovery. There is no question about it. There is investment monies waiting on the sidelines to go in if there can be assurances that the Greek system can there can be the kinds of structural reforms that the, that the creditors are mandating take place in Greece that will uh, create more transparency in the system, that will clean it up, that will make it more predictable. But it is ultimately going to have to be 
down to the Greek government to do it. And um, I know Costanza was saying that there is still some hope here, some serious uh, faith that this government is going to continue with the reform process to pass the appropriate uh, rules, uh, legal changes in order to be able to get there. But it's going to be a long road. And what I have advocated is that no one has more stake in a transparent, fair, and, 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 and non-corrupt system in Greece than the young entrepreneurs in Greece. And you know, we do these efforts to, and the, the Hellenic Initiative and the US government, we do these, uh, these things to try to help train Greek entrepreneurs. And I've said to the embassy, you don't need to teach a Greek how to be entrepreneurial. You need to put them, you know, you pick them up from Greece, you drop them in the United States where there's a system of rule of law that they can play by those rules and advance a business, and they go to the top fast. In Greece, they are thwarted again and again by this arcane system that must change. And so my advocacy with the embassy is bring over the experts in how to create the kinds of bureaucracies that will make it so that people can register a business and get their permits and get moving and have a level playing field and know what's required of them in advance. You know, I, I tell this story of my dad in my book, but it's really the fundamental story of our family. He, so I think most of you know, my father, Angelo, who is, would have been here, but he's, he's in Palm Springs right now, and he is the most dynamic, energetic, extraordinary person I know in my life, and I know many other people feel this way about Angelo too. Um, he was a farm worker in the Central Valley, 14 years old when he came here. And he went to school, and he was encouraged by some family to go to college. And he was able, with a little bit of education and a lot of entrepreneurial spirit and a fire in his belly, to to find opportunities and take advantage of opportunities in business. And at one point, and this was probably the turning point, he found this incredible opportunity outside of Sacramento for a major development, into, you know, a major real estate development opportunity. But he didn't have any money. So he goes to my Uncle Sam, who had a grocery store in San Francisco. And he says, Sam, how much money do you have? And he said, I don't know, Angela, I probably got about, you know, with the savings and everything, I probably got about $5,000. And Uncle Sam tells me this story, and he says, your father kind of looks like this, and he says, I think that's going to be enough. <laughs> <laughs> and, he bring, and Uncle Sam tells me the story, he says, your father brings me up, and we're out in the middle of, of farmland with one road and a stoplight, and, or, or a stop sign. And he says, this is what it's going to look like, Sam. There's going to be a big uh, grocery store and, and, and stores over here. There's going to be a big mall, and then there's going to be housing, and da, da, da. And this is in the 70s. And Sam lent him the money. And this was, in many ways, this was the big launch for him. And you know, for those of you who don't know, a few years ago, the Sacramento Bee, our, our hometown paper, said that Angelo Sokopoulos had changed the face of Sacramento more than anyone since Sutter, John Sutter, who found gold and started the gold <laughs> rush, right? Uh, and it started from going to Uncle Sam and saying, $5,000, that should be enough, you know? And Sam, my father would not have asked Uncle Sam for that money was his savings for his, his, his girls to go to college. And Uncle Sam wouldn't have given it to him if, there, if the only risk that they were taking were business risks, market risk. If the risk that they were taking was that somebody was going to show up at your door and say, give me a payoff or you have no project, give me a payoff or you have no deal, you wouldn't gamble your life savings if you had that kind of risks that were inherent in a system that, that was beset with corruption, right? So this is it. This is the fundamental 
element of the structural reforms that Greece is now faced with deciding whether or not they can try to change. And again, it goes back to this question of rule of law. It goes back to the, uh, to, to the question of whether or not the younger generation in Greece will do what we often say here in the United States, you never let a good crisis go to waste. This is their opportunity. There are trainers, there are, there are technicians who are ready and have been attempting to work with the Greek government to set up systems that will work better for business, particularly small and medium sized business. But if it works for the SMEs, it works for the big developers as well. And this is the opportunity. And I think that any chance any of you have to advocate for this very fundamental thing, please take it. Uh, and I am, I am hopeful. I am hopeful. It is a challenge. People don't change easy. Institutions don't change easy. But this is an opportunity. <laughs> Madam Ambassador, great to see you again. John Manos from Chicago. Yes. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Through your end, uh, by the way, uh, Senator Kunalagis really sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> Could you speak to us a little bit, please, about your experience, possibly from the diplomatic level, about the plight of the patriarchate, mm. what you saw, the rest of Europe, uh, from us here, the resolution being passed for freedom of religion through the 48 states. Sure. What else could we do, should we do, and your other experiences there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question. It's very important to take every opportunity when we're together to talk about the patriarchate. Uh, I visited the patriarchate the first time when I was a student. I was in, studying classics. We were in Istanbul uh, with the Dartmouth Classics. Uh, group and it happened to be Pascha and we went to, my father said, oh, you have to go. So we went to the Patriarchate uh, and then we were there for, on Friday night for services and the, uh, one of the bishops said to me, you know, you're invited to go to a very special place and he wrote down on a piece of paper where I was supposed to go and how I was supposed to get there to have Easter Sunday. And I had, there was one other Greek American student on the group, in the group, and I brought her with me. And we ended up on a boat to Halki. And we spent, I was 20 years old, and we spent Easter Sunday on Halki. Uh, Hebeliada, the Turks call it. Um, which, of course, is the location of the historic um, school seminary, uh, seminary um, which has been closed. It, it certainly was was already closed then in, in the uh, late, late 80s. So um, Marcus and I were married in the Patriarchate, and I write about how that came to be as well. Um, the fact that we as a community are so organized and so mobilized and continually are raising the issue at the highest level of the independence and freedom of the patriarch and the patriarchate is the only reason why they continue to have the level of protection that they do. You agree. We have to keep it up. We have to keep it up. We have to continue to raise this at the highest levels. I was married there because he invited me before I met Marcos. He said, when you're ready to get married, you come to the Patriarchate, and we will have a beautiful wedding for you. And what I didn't realize until, of course, we got there, we had so many friends and family came, Father Alex Carlutzis arranged the whole thing. We were on the front page of every major newspaper in Turkey. And it helped. I mean, we, for, for us, it was very personal that we wanted to be married there. But what we realized is that our act of doing it helped elevate the patriarchate and that the Greek American community was aware and involved in what was happening there. I will tell you one other thing, and I don't want, I'm really, I really don't mean to be partisan here, but I can tell you that Vice President Biden has been an enormous champion for the patriarch and the patriarchate and for Greece. And when Hillary Clinton was first lady, she has been so focused on the issue of all kinds of freedom, but religious freedom in particular. She went on a friendship visit to Istanbul 
And she made it clear that they were going to go and visit the Patriarchate. So this was in the early mid-90s. And the Turkish government did everything possible to dissuade her from going. And when it was clear that she was resolute, she was not backing down, she was invited, mostly through the efforts of our community here, and she was going. She said she was going, she was going. In the middle of the night before her visit, they went, the Turkish government went and paved the road in front of the Patriarchate because it was so deteriorated. So keeping the spotlight on the Patriarchate, the 60 Minutes pieces, the advancing of his lectures on the environment, of the Patriarch's lectures on, on the environment, of, of the fact that this is the ecumenical patriarchate, not one among equals, but the first among equals, that this is incredibly important work for our community to continue to do. And I, I will say, I do think, and I do believe very much, that if Hillary Clinton becomes president of the United States, we ha will have a very, very powerful advocate uh, in this work. But it will continue to be the fight of our community uh, it, it, it has been going on since 1453, and it will continue to, to go on into the future, and our role is very, very important. And just to add on that, uh, in great part due to your efforts, she was the first first lady in U.S. history to visit the Patriarchate, and when she was there, said, I will bring my husband back. Yeah. She did, and he was the first president of the United States to visit the Ecumenical Patriarchate. That's very special. Chris, you want to finish us off? <clears throat> Years ago, while in Vienna, the late Metropolitan Michael of Austria and Hungary. Yes, I knew him. Was telling us that there was a Greek Orthodox cathedral in Budapest. And it was confiscated by the communists during and after the Second World War. When Hungary became, an, after the restoration of the democracy, and Hungary became a democratic state. They refused to return the cathedral to the Orthodox. Yeah. And the Metropolitan was telling us that if he had the money, which he claimed he did not, he would have taken the Hungarian government to the European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg. Are you aware of the <laughs> dispute? And were you able to help as the ambassador of the United States of Greek Orthodox faith in the return of the cathedral to the Orthodox Church. Um, if any of you have the opportunity to go to Budapest, I encourage you to go and see it. It's beautiful. It's right on the Danube. And it was built by the Greek community of Budapest in the 1800s. Uh, many Greeks wanted did not want to live under the Ottoman Empire. And if you remember the borders of the Ottoman Empire, they ended at Belgrade um, on the way to Europe. The border was Belgrade. And if you traveled from Belgrade up the Danube, the first major city you would hit outside of the Ottoman Empire was Budapest. And it was a thriving economy. Again, I talk a little bit about that. It was one of the capitals of the world. The first subway system in mainland Europe was there. It had the largest, uh, the largest um, commodities exchange in Europe was there. It was the bread basket. And at the time in the Industrial Revolution of Europe was at the forefront of the industrialization of farm products, right? Wheat into packaged flour as opposed to just local mills, right? and uh, tremendous wealth, tremendous prosperity, and the Austro-Hungarian Empire for a Greek was much more free than being in the Ottoman Empire. And so there was a very, very vibrant Greek community there, um, uh, and they built this beautiful church. It was solely owned by the Greek Orthodox a part of the Greek, it was not under the patriarchate though. So this was part of the legal difficulty is that when they built the church, they were separate, they were autocephalous, right? Because they said, well, the, the patriarch is under the Ottomans, we, this church is independent. 
During the Soviet uh, era, the Russian church shared the Greek Orthodox Church. Now, worshiping was not technically illegal during the communist times, but if you went to church, your children would not have a place at the university, um, you couldn't have a good job, and so the membership dwindled significantly. But it still was there. And now this church, one of the steeples was blown up during the bombing at, at the end of World War II, but it, but it remained, you know, the windows were blown, but, but, um, but it's still intact, roughly intact. And so during those years, it kind of operated with both, a presence of both. Something happened, and no one is exactly sure what, but there was where, where the Russian church basically took it over. And when Vladimir Putin went to town to visit, he went, in, he went there to worship and made it clear that they claimed it. Um, there was a court case, and the Greek Orthodox community petitioned to have it returned to them. And the judge ruled that since that Greek Orthodox community was a different Greek Orthodox community than the one that built it, that it couldn't be returned to them because it was never theirs. Now, who were these Greeks? I thought I had heard every diaspora story until I got to Hungary. And the Greeks in Hungary were those who either fled after um, the uh, Civil War, the communists who fled because they were afraid of a backlash, or they went willingly because they were seeking the vision of communism. So you all know the story, you know Nicholas Gage's uh, Eleni, right, the children who were being taken from northern Greece. There were orphanages, Greek orphanages, all over Hungary that were these children who were, who were taken uh, uh, during that time, and then the parents who went to try to find them after, and then never had the opportunity to go back. There was a whole town called Beloyani, that, so, so that was the new Greek community. And I will tell you, these ended up being a lot of our closest friends during the time that we were there. So since then, there seems to have been some kind of a rapprochement where the, now they are sharing the church again. I believe that in their way, they have resolved it for the moment in the sense that it's being used for both. Um, whether or not there can be any other solution, any other legal solution at this point, I really don't know. Um, what you find in, the, in Hungary is that you know, the 20th century was, was what they would say, uh, at cri not crisis upon crisis, but um, you know, just catastrophe upon catastrophe for them. And it, 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 the way that I would often talk about it is, if you think about the three greatest conflicts of the 20th century for the United States, the First World War, the Second World War, and the Cold War, Hungary was on the losing side in World War I, losing side of World War II, and the wrong side of the Iron Curtain. And the conflicting interests from the Holocaust and everything that was taken from the Jewish communities and destroyed in the most incomprehensible ways possible. And the terrible things that happened during the communist times. Everybody was disenfranchised in one way or another. And I'm not equating the levels of disenfranchisement, right? I'm not saying that one group was more or less than the other, but I certainly think that if you study what happened during the Holocaust, you would recognize as well that it was truly the, the greatest um, crimes were committed during the Holocaust. But, um, but they're, they're so destroyed in terms of trying to figure out what is fairness anymore, that it makes it very difficult. And 
for me, when I, because I, I was following it there, of course, and looking into whether or not there was a role for the United States to play in that disagreement, um, to the nervousness of my staff. But um, my very close friend, Eleni Korani, uh, if you can imagine, my dearest friend in the country was a Greek Hungarian named Eleni. <laughs> and uh, she was married in that church. She baptized her children in Austria. And now they're going back and they're in the church again. So if they have the kind of rapprochement that allows the Greek community to worship there, to me that's a very important thing. And I'm not saying that there isn't a more ideal situation, but I will tell you that the, the levels of disputes over historic you know, ownership and, 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 and the losses and the, the shifts that have taken place, it is beyond anything that we can understand, I think, unless you really, you know, have the kind of education, you know, maybe that I've had, um, but it makes it very difficult. So I'm very heartened for the fact that they are at least worshiping again together there. One final thing, if you haven't okay. had a chance to see the Benaki exhibit, you can do so on the way back to your rooms. It's just basically to the left. I'm sure the Benaki folks can guide you. But uh, Madam Ambassador, thank you very thank much. Thank you, and thank you all very much. Thank you. I'd like to add my thanks to Madam Ambassador. You've honored us tremendously. It was an amazing conversation. And um, you not only make women proud, I think you make everyone proud. <laughs> thank and um, thank you very much, and we wish you all the best. Thank you, Mike. It was a very engaging dialogue.